Let me start by saying that uh, my name is Alison McGovern. I am the Labour Member of Parliament for Wirral South and here really in my capacity as the uh, member, as a member of the of Parliament's Works of Art uh, Committee that advises the Speaker. So can I just begin by welcoming everybody to Parliament on behalf of the Speaker's Advisory Committee on Works of Art. Thank you so much for coming. And can I also thank the Parliament Week team whose support of this event has made it all possible. Uh, before I begin, just a small housekeeping point. Uh, if you hear a bell, it's a division bell. <laughs> There'll be many people in this room who know that. But just in case there is anybody who might worry that it was a fire, it isn't. People may leave to vote, but don't worry about that either. Um, in the unlikely event of a fire, there will be a voice alarm and staff will show you the nearest exit. On this day, 100 years ago, Emily Wilding Davison undertook her protest at the Derby, the result of which was that she collided with the King's horse and was fatally injured. She never regained consciousness and died four days later. This evening's event provides us with an opportunity to mark Emily's sacrifice for the causes of votes of, for women and to show the impressive range of resources that Parliament provides on the campaign for votes for women and women's parliamentary history more generally. Before I say a few words about uh, Emily, I just want to add that I personally feel that it's amazing uh, to wonder at what those who will hear about this evening might have thought about us here, standing here today. And as I gaze around at the many women parliamentarians and women who give their time to parliament in other ways, I cannot imagine what they would say to us in this room. Um, I do know that what we achieve, we do so because we stand on the platform that they built for us. And for that, we are truly grateful. Emily Wilding Davison was a regular visitor and protester at Parliament. She is best known for her overnight stay in the chapel broom cupboard on census night in 1911, but that was only one of a number of protests. The parliamentary archives hold police reports of five further incidents which mention her. She hid in a ventilation shaft, broke a window in the Crown Office, threw a hammer through a division lobby window, and was once discovered on a staircase near the Commons Chamber in the middle of the night. Emily and the other suffragette pro protesters presented the pa palace authorities with many challenges. As they are today, the Sergeant at Arms and the Metropolitan Police were responsible for enabling Parliament to sit securely and undisturbed. There has been much written on the policing of suffragettes, but very little has been written about how this was dealt with inside the building. Police were not used to deal dealing with respectable, well-dressed, middle-class women who suddenly stood up and shouted protest, chained themselves to statues, and so on. The two men responsible were Sir David Erskine, the Sergeant-at-Arms, and Chief Inspector Scantlebury of the Metropolitan Police. The Parliamentary Archives holds a file which includes more than 50 police reports about suffrage incidents in the building mostly by Inspector Scantlebury reporting on events to the Sergeant-at-Arms. I am delighted, therefore, to introduce you to their modern counterparts, Lawrence Ward, the current Sergeant-at-Arms, and Inspector Richford, one of six police inspectors working on the parliamentary estate. Andy and Lawrence are going to read out some of the archive documents written and received by their predecessors for us. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to have been invited to take part in this reception, uh, marking the centenary of Emily Wilding Davison's death. I'm a police inspector working here in the 21st century. I'm going to read you all a couple of extracts from official police records made here when Emily was at the height of her suffragette activities a hundred years ago. I must say it struck me when I first read the reports that despite the passage of a hundred years, the security challenges facing the house authorities and the police remain strikingly similar today. <laughs> the first report was made by the Palace of Westminster Police Inspector Scantlebury on the 11th of February 1908, and he wrote, 
suffragettes visit, I beg to report that at 4 p.m. on the 11th, two large Pantechnican vans drove up to St. Stephen's entrance and slowed down when a large number of women commenced to jump out of the vans, making a determined rush for the entrance. I ordered the doors to be closed and sent for and turned out the reserves, and many arrests were made by the police on duty outside. Only two, viz, Mrs. Dermid and Singer, were allowed in as they desired to, be, to present a petition to Sir H. Campbell Bannerman. They were seen by his private secretary and he refused to entertain it and they both left the building in an orderly manner. The latter woman was also seen by Mr. R. Macdonald MP. All passed off correct inside. Signed C. Scandlebury Inspector. The second extract is from a report made by the same officer on the 24th of June 1910. Only he was by now Chief Inspector Scandlebury. Clearly, a hundred years ago, promotion could be achieved even when things were not going very well professionally. <laughs> if only it were the same today. And Chief Inspector Scandlebury wrote, excuse me, I have today received the following report from PC Abberley. At 8.5 p.m. I was on duty at the Chancellor's Gate entrance to the House of Lords when the prisoner, who I later identified as Emily Wilding Davison, came to me and said, I have broken two windows along there at the same pointing to the Crown Office, House of Lords. I took her to the spot indicated where I saw two small panes of glass broken and a quantity of broken glass and chalk scattered about the footway. I said to her, are these the windows? <laughs> she replied, yes. <laughs> I asked her why she did it. She said, for certain reasons. <laughs> I then took her into custody and brought her to Cannon Row Station where she was charged. Inside the room was found two pieces of chalk with labels attached bearing the following written in ink. On the first, to Mr Asquith, Give full facilities for the new bill for women's suffrage, signed E.W. Davison. On the second, to Mr. Asquith, intelligent womanhood will take this insult, be wise, signed E.W. Davison. <laughs> A third label, which had become detached from the chalk, was also found in the room, on which was the following, to Mr. Asquith, be wise in time, women, women, women will not be trifled with, signed E.W. Davison. And finally, a short transcript of a letter from Chief Inspector to Scantlebury to Sir David Erskine, the Sergeant at Arms, on the 23rd of June. Sir, that suffragette found in the air shaft some time ago has broke some windows in the Crown Office Old Palace Yard and has been taken to Cannon Row to be charged. And I'd like to hand over to the new Sergeant at Arms, please, or the current, the 21st century. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, Scantlebury, um, <laughs> Chief Inspector of Police. Um, if I can just say to start with that it's um, an absolute honour, a privilege to be here 100 years on. Um, still wearing the same uniform. I don't know where the slide's gone of my predecessor. Um, but also just to note that my predecessor, Jewel Pay, um, was a sergeant at arms and was a woman. So um, <laughs> progress indeed, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and is a woman. My good man, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so this is the transcript of a letter from Speaker Lowther to me, Sir David Erskine. Dear Erskine, a lady who breaks the windows of the Crown Office and gets into our ventilating shaft is evidently not a desirable personage to have hanging about St Stephen's Hall. So her name had better go on the index, Expurgatius. Yours sincerely, James W. Lowther. Hmm. Right, I'd better script a letter to Scantlebury. So, dear Chief Inspector of Police, 24th of June, 1910, Miss Emily Davidson is not to be admitted in future within the precincts of the House of Commons. Sergeant at Arms. What a proud record. <laughs> That was brilliant. Um, thank you, Andy and Lawrence, for those readings, which really did convey the richness of the Parliamentary Archives' um, resources on this subject. And 
do speak to the archivists who are here tonight if you want to find out more about their holdings. I just found out that there's three million items in the parliamentary archives, which I didn't know. Uh, there is currently a display of original parliamentary archives documents relating to Emily in the Royal Gallery, uh, which is in the House of Lords, including the letter from the Speaker. Uh, the exhibition is available to visitors taking public tours. Next, I am very pleased to introduce Elizabeth Crawford. Elizabeth is a suffrage historian known, I'm sure, to many, many of you. Her latest research has been on the life of a suffragist, Kate Parry Fry, who was also, interestingly, the daughter of a Member of Parliament. Kate Parry Fry left extensive diaries, and Elizabeth has recently published an edited volume of her diaries relating to her suffrage work. This includes an account of Kate's preparation and attendance of Emily Wilding Davison's funeral procession through London, which Elizabeth is going to read for us now. Elizabeth, oh, she's there. Yes, Kate Fry's um, father was elected as uh, MP for uh, North Kensington. He was a radical liberal uh, in 1892 and was admitted at the same time as Keir Hardy. He wasn't perhaps quite as uh, radical as Keir Hardy, but uh, um, Kate was brought up in a household which was very interested in liberal politics. And... Um, she was always interested in suffrage from uh, just uh, as, as people were from about 1906 when the WSPU came to London, although um, she had uh, known about the, the suffragist societies, uh, it was the, um, when the suffragettes came, everybody got interested. She joined a suffragist society and did a lot of volunteering and organising balls and fundraising and selling uh, um, newspapers outside Chancery Lane tube station, all that kind of thing. But then um, by 1909, 1910, her father had lost all his money and she was very pleased to take up paid employment as an organiser for a new small constitutional society about which very little is known called the New Constitutional Society for Women's Suffrage. And in her diary, and I brought the one, it's on the table there, a great thick volume, that she kept umpteen of uh, these volumes and she writes extensively daily. She describes what it was like being an organiser around uh, the country, knocking on doors, trying to get chairman for meetings, um, putting up with rowdy boys and fireworks being thrown, and all the usual things. But she was very, very keen on the big spectacle. She was outside here, um, standing in Parliament Square on the night of Black Friday, as it was called, in November 1910. Um, after which Emily Davison threw stones through the windows inside the House of Commons. And uh, one of the, when she heard that Emily Davison had died, her first thought was to buy a black hat. She was working in uh, Norfolk at the time in Fakenham. So she bought her black hat in Fakenham, got her mother to send her uh, black coat and skirt up to London, rented a room there. And then on Saturday the 14th of June, she describes how with her fiancé, we got to Victoria. The procession had just started. We saw it splendidly at the start until we were driven away from our position and then couldn't see for the crowds. And then we walked right down Buckingham Palace Road and joined in the procession at the end. It really was most wonderful, the really organized part. Groups of women in black with white lilies, in white and in purple, and lots of clergymen and special sort of pallbearers each side of the coffin. She gave her life publicly to make known to the public the demand of votes for women. It was only fitting she should be honoured publicly by the comrades. It must have been most imposing. The crowds were thinner in Piccadilly, but the windows were filled. For the people had all tramped north, and later on the crowds were tremendous. And oh, what a quality filled the windows and pavements in Bloomsbury. The ladies in the kimonos were a nightmare to me. I'll give you a little pause for thought about that. <laughs> The people who stood watching were mostly reverent and well-behaved. We were with the ragtag and bobtail element, but they were very earnest people. It was tiring. Sometimes we had long waits, sometimes the pace was tremendous. Most of the time we could hear a band playing the funeral march. Near King's Cross, the procession lost all semblance of a procession, one crowded process. Everyone was moving. We lost our banner. We all got separated. 
And our idea was to get away from the huge crowd of unwashed, unhealthy creatures pressing on on all, all sides. We went down the tubeway, but I didn't feel like a tube and went through to the other side, finding ourselves in King's Cross Station. Saying we wanted tea, we went onto the platform and there was a train, a special train for the coffin, and finding a seat, sank down and we didn't move until the train left. Lots of the processionists were on the train, which was taking the body to Northumberland for interment and another huge procession tomorrow. To think that she had to give her life because men will not listen to the claims of reason and of justice. I was so tired I felt completely done. We found our way to the refreshment room and there were several of the pallbearers there having tea. So as I say, Kate was always there on the big occasion. I think that really explains to us just how powerful and important uh, event her funeral was. It's amazing to yeah. think uh, how much people were, were moved at that time. So thank you, Elizabeth, for that reading. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's there at the end of the formal part of the evening. Please do feel free to look around at all the displays and resources uh, around this room. If there is anybody who hasn't yet signed up for a suffragette tour, there are a few places left, so do sign up now. There are tours at 7 p.m., 7.15, and 7.30, and they last for approximately 20 minutes. Um, alternatively, in this very excellent leaflet, uh, there is a, a map inside it, so you're very welcome to go and investigate the sites uh, yourself. Although, I would say, as somebody who's spent a lot of time getting lost around Parliament, <laughs> I would go for the tour. Uh, the permanent display uh, on Parliament and Votes for Women, which includes a number of historic items acquired by the works of our committee, uh, including two new acquisitions, a WSPU flag and an NUWSS badge can be seen on the way to the visitors gallery, which is just behind number nine on the booklet uh, map. And of course, please do take the opportunity to go to the visitors gallery and watch the debates in the chamber um, as the House of Commons is still sitting and will be for a good while yet. So do <laughs> pop up there. It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> It is. Finally, I, I must just say a massive thank you to all those um, involved this evening. Um, but I really want to say as well that as a member of the Works of Art Committee, I'm sure our brilliant chair, Frank, will, will bear me out that we have tried very hard to improve the uh, representation <coughs> of women and also particularly this important issue and it's of great pride to me and I think I can speak for the committee to say that it's of great pride for, of, for us to host this, even, this evening's event and I sincerely thank you all for coming and making it such, such a success. But I do want to thank especially our speakers, Lawrence, Andy and Elizabeth. They did brilliantly, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, the Parliament Week team, Parliamentary Outreach, Parliamentary Education Service, the House of Commons Library and Parley Agenda, who promote gender inequality in Parliament. Uh, and finally, the Parliamentary Archives and the Curator's Office, and uh, Mary Takanyanagi and Mel Melanie Unwin, particularly, for organising this event. They have done an absolutely phenomenal and brilliant job. And would you please help me in thanking them all in the usual way. Thank you.